Hello and welcome to News Click. We have with us Dr. Satyajit Rath from National Institute of Immunology and we are going to discuss the report that has come out, all the 2005 discoveries in the Damanisi area where they have found a certain very well preserved skulls and the conclusions thereof. So it's being argued that this really changes the way we should look at human lineages and how we have categorized them earlier and this seems to show that there are much less number of lineages than we had assumed earlier. How does that uh, square up? This entire recent event underlines something that I think we should keep in mind when we talk about scientific discoveries and theories, which is the less you know about something, the more significant every new discovery seems to be. The more you know, the less significance the same discovery may have. This is particularly applicable to um, this field of, let us say, paleoarchaeology. The material to base guesses on is very little. You find a part of a skull somewhere, you find one bone, and on the basis of the shape the size, the arrangement, you make guesses about what our lineage ancestors looked like. This is not to suggest that those guesses are wrong, it's simply to suggest that they are guesses based on relatively scanty facts. And it's in that sense that this Georgian discovery in the Manisi carry significance. So what seems to be the case is that this is a place in which carnivorous animals, the image of a saber-toothed tiger killing hominids uh, irresistibly comes to mind. Carnivorous animals were using some part of this these caves as uh, a place to drag prey and eat. So there are all sorts of bones including hominid meaning human-like uh, boats. And as part of that, there are five different um, skulls in various stages of completeness and preservation. And all five, by dating, seem to be fairly close to each other in time. So it's reasonable to say that over some over a few centuries, carnivores have killed and eaten and left these remnants. A simple interpretation from that is that they are all the same species and yet their variation is enormous. That's one point. The second point is that the one completed skull that you're referring to, the, the one relatively very complete skull and along with what appears to be its lower jawbone shows an extraordinarily mixed set of features. The small brain case looks like a pre-homo genus of hominids, Australopithecus. But many features of the facial structure look as though they belong to the genus Homo, which is later and closer to us than Australopithecus. These combinations and the diversity amongst the five skulls together has led the investigators to suggest that what we've been thinking of in these scattered ways across Asia and across Africa, the many different uh, skulls and skeletons found over these kinds of periods. Remember, we are talking about this uh, find being dated to about 18 lakh years ago. 1.8 million years back. It is possible, the investigators are suggesting, plausibly, that what we've been thinking of as multiple species of the genus Homo, we are Homo sapiens, there have been multiple uh, hominid uh, species postulated, may not actually have been multiple species, may all be simply intraspecies variation, just different people with different skull shapes, uh, bone shapes and so on and so forth. Interestingly, they do, a, they do this on the basis of a three-dimensional computer uh, reconstruction and uh, one, as soon as you do that, you bring all the both explicit and implicit approximations in those modelings as major potential confounders into the analysis. 
But if you do that, and if you accept that reconstruction at face value for the moment, then the variation in all of these skull types is not more than the variation in present day humans or in present day chimpanzees and is much less than the variation between present day humans and present day chimpanzees. As a matter of fact, is much less than the variation between a lineage of chimpanzees very closely related to classical chimpanzees, namely the bonobos. So bonobos and chimpanzees are both species belonging to the genus Pan. And apparently, apparently I say because of the modeling uh, confounders, their dis distinctions are greater than the distinctions found in these collections. All of which leads plausibly to thinking that maybe, maybe there weren't as many different branches of the proto-human uh, lineage as we've been used to thinking. Now, the other interesting part of it is it's a fairly uh, complete skull, as you said. It's, there are other skulls in, the, in that uh, find. But it is also a very early coming out of Africa that it does show that our pre our ancestors, if you will, came out of Africa much earlier than we thought. This is not, after all, the first um, find of that period of hominid uh, remains outside Africa. There, there have been others. Um, clearly, there have been multiple emergences of proto-human lineages out of Africa, starting from a couple of million years ago. Um, to most recently, about uh, between 100 to 200,000 years ago. How many of these were different species? Is the question that is therefore being addressed. There's something that we need to remember in all this. We are making guesses from bones. But what exactly do we mean by species? And the short answer in every text, school textbook of biology is that species, so two individuals belong to the same species, if, if they belong to separate sexes, if they mate, they produce fertile offspring. That's a very functional definition of species. Any extrapolation we make about speciation from these bones is never going to be confirmatory. And in this context, let me remind you of um, an older conversation in this field, but from a slightly different point of view. When the Neanderthal genome was sequenced, it turned out that our contemporary human DNA clearly had footprints of the Neanderthal genome. Now, we tend to think of the Neanderthal as a separate species. We have done so for a very long time. If they were a separate species, how did their DNA get into our DNA? If their DNA got into our DNA, then Neanderthals and true humans must have bred together and produced fertile offspring, from whom, presumably, we are descended in some fashion. Under those circumstances, the notion of species is being used with extraordinary uncertainty and elasticity in all these conversations. So we are not using what we'd use in other, exactly. <laughs> other, other folks, shall we say, other mammals. Absolutely. We are not using the same standards when it comes to Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, and also the other ones, uh, the third. The Denisovans. Denisovans. There that also we exactly. have found genetic uh, remnants in our uh, DNA. Correct. So all three have interbred. But we still tend to consider them as if they're independent species. I think it's much more interesting for us to begin to look at the extraordinary diversity that hominid lineages have had over the past couple of million years. And it says something interesting about us. It's quite probable, it's no surprise either to statisticians or to biologists, but it bears saying, it's quite probable that we are an accidental sublineage that survived um, rather than there being a notion of progressive evolution in some fashion. There is some 
substance to that because the genetic diversity within the human species would tend to show that we came very close to extinction uh, because the very variation is so little. Absolutely. It's said that 7 billion human beings have genetic diversity which is less than a uh, tribe of uh, a herd of baboons in Africa. So that's the degree of uh, close to extinction that we must have come to. Would that be right? Somewhat overstated, I suppose, but 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 um, I think uh, that's a reasonable uh, extrapolation to make at least. However, there is a feature of these skulls in the Georgian excavation that has gotten gone on. Uh, remarked upon or at least not been remarked as much as what we've been talking about so far. And that is the fact that one of these skulls appears to be that of a very elderly male. And the skull of this very elderly male is almost entirely toothless. It means that a male that has not had his teeth for a fair length of time survives. 1.8 million years ago. Consider what that says about the formation of social structures and communities. These are guesses that we are making. These are guesses that I am implicitly proposing. But all said and done, as we have just discussed, the speciation issue is also mainly guesses. And here is a guess about how old our humanness might be that we may have had our proto-ancestors may well have had social structures that involved chewing food for and keeping alive that most biologically useless of species members, namely an elderly non-breeding male. So this whole argument that tooth and claw evolution survival of the fittest in human society, which is what underlines a lot of neoliberal capitalism as ethos, would then be controverted by a 1.8 billion year skull, even though one could argue that there is this evidence is also rather sparse, but nevertheless it seems to be quite yeah, credible. At the very least, it gives us something interesting to think about. On that note, we will Close this discussion and come back when we find new and more sparse finds. Thank you very much.